Welcome back to Global News Relay. I'm Juan Avila. And I'm Elsa Mejia. As we head to the Lone Star State, a story about a Texas man who is taking some of his southern hospitality to Minnesota. Many Wardo opened a store in Casson, Minnesota in December, but he says he's not doing it for the money. Our motto is poverty knows no boundaries. Are put into a bank account that used to pay rent and utilities. Any leftover money is kept in the account to help people in need. And now, here's a look at the Texas State's contribution to the Global News Relay. Welcome to Global News Relay Solutions Journalism. For the University Star, I'm Bree Watkins. And I'm Denise Cervantes. Thanks for tuning in. The Texas State School of Journalism traveled to Nicaragua earlier this year. Let's take a look at what they did there. On January 2nd, 2017, 34 Texas State University students and faculty arrived in Nicaragua. Their mission was to provide health care to rural villages in the country that has an absence of medical help. More than 150 people in four rural communities were assessed and treated by the healthcare students. In this video, the Texas State University Global News Team focuses on reporting on the lack of resources and specialty of healthcare in Nicaragua, as well as the seminars performed for the first time by the Texas State Health Professions faculty. In countries like Nicaragua, the allied field isn't there. I just came from Guyana, and it was the same thing. The allied field of respiratory care is not there. When we went to the hospital, we knew that nursing usually took on our field. So nurses were trained to do what we, we typically did. Um, so looking around, we noticed that nurses were in the ED, in the emergency room. Um, they worked in their intensive care, their n neonatal nursery area and when we asked them where their intensive care, their critical care area was, nursing was there. That's nursing that did their, or physicians, they worked with doctors and nursing. And um, for us, even in, I find that even in America, the knowledge of what we do in our profession isn't as um, basically out there as it should be. I think we offer where not only do we learn from the community, they can benefit from what we offer in education. One of the physicians actually said that. Um, he said that they are very grateful for whatever education we can offer. As far as staffing, I didn't see a lot of different hospitals but there were more people in a very small hospital in the uh, uh, Tequintepe, little small hospital, um, because they had to do everything manually. So they had to have a lot of bodies doing very time consuming things for what would take a few minutes in a, a more automated lab. Um, in the uh, Messiah Hospital, there seemed to be only one or two people for the entire lab. So that was kind of less staffed than you might see in the, the laboratory in the United States. But it didn't seem that they had the volume of testing that uh, we would have here. Another issue that I saw um, that several of the hospitals, or the, the small hospital, did not have any kind of uh, culturing uh, abilities. So for any kind of infection, they had to send it off if they thought that that patient had some kind of infection. So there's a delay in um, treatment. So if a person has an infection, either they're delaying treatment or people are self-medicating with the pharmacies because they have just open, you know, there's no regulation on antibiotic use. So the doctors told me uh, that we were working with, that there is a significant problem with antibiotic resistance in Nicaragua because people self-medicate with antibiotics when they don't might not need it. So not having those kinds of uh, facility or um, capabilities, resources on site delays or um, enables the wrong kind of treatment. This exact hospital was um, conserving um, glass slides and they're just slides that we make blood smears on and we look at them under the microscope. 
So um, they would wash them and use them again. And sometimes they would not use them for the same thing. So they would make like a micro slide and it had gram stain on it. And they would wash it and reuse it for a blood, a blood smear. Right, right. So, you know, it was just alarming seeing something that looked like bacteria in a blood smear. They, they did what they could with what they had. They conserved what they could. Um, for the most part, it wasn't too terrible. Um, it seemed like most things um, were in guidelines, but um, there were a lot of things that were not quite up to standard. Yes, I did have the opportunity to uh, teach the nurses there in Nicaragua on tracheostomy care as well as uh, chest tube care. And there was an attendance about 24 nurses and they actually worked night shift and she called them back to come listen and they were from the emergency department as well as from the critical care units. I think the, the disparities that I saw from here in the States versus Nicaragua was related to how much more each nurse on the med surge floor uh, does than what the nurse does here. In the United States, we have the opportunity to have a physical therapist, occupational therapist, dietitian, as well as a nurse's aide to assist us with care or work as a team for the care of our patients. Um, I think that from my observation and how I noted the discussion points through a translator was that they're used to it. They have had to make do and this is they don't know anything else besides what they're doing and they're doing a great job. Nicaragua's public health care system contains problems that go beyond the scope and capability of the Texas State Interprofessional Team's grasp. Until government intervention and legislation rebudgets and educates its people, the public sector will continue to suffer. However, it is the work of students and faculty like the Interprofessional Team to Nicaragua that will help these issues. Although the impact may seem small, the ability to educate will pass information from people to people in Nicaragua benefiting a community for a lifetime to come. The University Star had the privilege of covering the 2017 presidential inauguration in Washington, D.C. The day after Donald Trump was sworn into office, thousands of women and activists came together for the Women's March to demonstrate solidarity by defending women and immigrants and maintaining civic rights. The march was composed of people and families all across the country. Diamond Robinson, a resident of Washington, D.C., expressed concern she had of the newly elected President Donald Trump. I actually chose to protest because I'm worried about our future and how, you know, dealing with other countries, how it will go. And I just feel like this is not what America needs right now. Organizers of the rally said it aimed to peacefully empower women and demand that their rights be protected and respected under Trump's administration. The movement inspired other states to participate in sister marches and even spread worldwide, including countries such as Peru, Kenya, and Israel. According to the Women's March on Washington website, over 5 million activists participated in the march worldwide and over 1 million in Washington, D.C. This event marked one of the largest marches in American history. The rally began at 10 a.m. January 21st with various speakers and performers. Among them was actress America Ferrara, who encouraged women and immigrants to continue to fight for their future. California Senator Kamala Harris said this is a pivotal time for America to figure out what its character represents. Leading up to the inauguration and continuing today, Texas State students and activists gather around the Fighting Stallion statue to exercise their First Amendment right. Students have made a tradition to rub the stallions before their exam for good luck, but more importantly, the stallions has been designated as a free speech area. Dating back as far as the Vietnam War, students have gathered around the stallion statue to voice their opinions through various of peaceful protests. The day after the election, hundreds of students gathered around the stallions to express their concerns or support for Donald Trump. A couple Texas State students share their experience with the stallions. Still growing, um, but I, I did notice like students peeling off and joining uh, uh, the, the group uh, under the stallions. Uh, I wasn't there though when it was at his like took up the whole Common body. subjects of discussions during protests include politics, abortion, or religion. The 17-foot iconic landmark was introduced to the Texas State University Quad 
in 1951. Well, I think it's fine how it is. Uh, it doesn't cause too many problems, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows people to talk. Even though you don't necessarily need that kind of place on a campus, you could just say things out loud. But it's nice that it is encouragement to do so. The statue itself was a gift from a couple in South Carolina. Some of the larger protests this year included a sit-in for the Black Lives Matter movement, a protest after this year's election, and a protest after the first executive order calling for an immigration ban by President Donald Trump. No, I mean, I, I like it. I mean, and so far, I haven't seen anything that would warrant to, like, regulation. I haven't seen any, um, you know, anyone getting too uh, violent or, you know, yelling at the... It, mo the the majority of the protests I've seen were like uh, silent protests. While most college students would be concerned with final exams towards the end of the semester or Christmas break, Texas State students took to the Stallions to share opinions about the distractions that were found on campus last fall semester. In the fall, anti-diversity flyers were circulated around campus, sit-ins took place in front of the president's office, and petitions began to circulate around the campus asking officials to act. A couple of these petitions asked for a safe space campus and another asked for the Texas State drill team, the Strutters, to rethink their decision of performing at President-elect Donald Trump's inauguration. The protests the day after the election began with students holding signs and rainbow flags to support the LGBT community. The protest itself began as a sit-in while students sat silently in front of the stallions and some wore duct tape on their mouths. Later, the protests and counter-protests grew to hundreds of students and attracted many media outlets. For the University Star, I'm Denise Cervantes. And I'm Bray Watkins. Thanks again for watching. Coming up on the Global News Relay, one woman in North Alabama is using a hat to make a big statement against President Trump. Plus, how families in Mexico City are Todos. coming together to find the the And a community college right here in Fresno giving adult students a second chance at an education. Mm -hmm. 